What's being shown now with chiral induced spin selectivity is that you have to have had near perfect chirality at the start of life. It's not something that you could have evolved into. Dave in his video likes to just say, oh, he just blows it off. He says, this is something esoteric that Tour talks about. No, just because you can't answer it doesn't mean that it's esoteric. It is a real thing. Hi, I'm Steve Meyer from Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture, and we have taken a particular interest in this uh, spirited exchange that's been taking place on the internet between uh, Dave Farina, uh, also dubbed Professor Dave, and uh, Professor James Tour of Rice University. Dr. Tour is one of the most distinguished scientists in the world, rated one of the top 50 scientists in the world. He has 600 peer-reviewed publications or more and 150 some odd patents. He's a specialist in organic synthesis and nanotechnology. So one, two, three, four, five carbons. Professor Dave is a, an internet blogger who has a tremendous following online and has brought to the attention of many the controversy over the origin of life and what's called evolutionary abiogenesis. Hey everyone, it's been quite some time since my two-part series demolishing every last one of James Tour's ridiculous talking points. He's been a staunch critic of Dr. Tour and some of Dr. Tour's videos and I wanted to just start, uh, Jim, by asking you about this controversy, why you decided to weigh in in the first place. Um, some might have seen it as a bit of a mismatch between uh, a person of your eminence and a, an internet blogger. Why did you uh, decide that this this uh, issue needed to be engaged in the way you've engaged it? Well, I you know I have nothing in particular against uh, Dave Farina. Um, I was just minding my own business, giving my own talks, and he came out with a video called "Elucidating the Agenda of James Tour," as if I had some agenda behind uh, speaking on abiogenesis. And and my work is always just just trying to expose the current work in, in, in uh, abiogenesis and origin of life research and, and I think do the work that reviewers should have done when those papers first came out because I felt that uh, uh, actually that work screamed out that uh, uh, this could not be how life actually formed. And so when, when, uh, uh, when he came out with this video, every slide that he showed in the video was wrong. Every slide was wrong, and uh, um, he has he has many viewers, and and I thought well it, it'd be good to to straighten this out, and so I came out with a 13 part series on abiogenesis, but I had to go through a lot of the background chemistry, and in doing that, you know I never called uh, Dave Farina stupid. He says I called him stupid over and over again. I never called him stupid once. I never never did. And uh, I just talked about the science that was there, and I said that Dave was wrong. Uh, uh, he was wrong on, on every point that he had made on that series. And so, so I, I just pointed so, so that you, out. Oh, yeah, sorry to interrupt. So you, you, you had a series of, uh, I think, from what we've seen, very informative videos about the problems facing attempts to explain the origin of life from simpler non-living chemicals. And maybe we should actually start there just for our, our listeners and viewers. Uh, this is... There, there are two branches of evolutionary theory. There's the uh, chemical evolutionary theory, which attempts to explain how you get the first living cell from simpler non-living chemicals. And then there's biological evolution, which attempts to explain how you get new forms of life from simpler pre-existing forms. Your uh, videos addressed only that first issue, the origin of, uh, of the first life from simpler chemicals. Um, and so anyway, you put that, that series out, and then uh, Dave Farina came back with, a, with some more videos challenging you and th but this time he cited a lot of experts in origin of life research origin of life biochemistry and i think that's given you a little bit more of a, an opening i think to um, have a, a scientific discussion at a high scientific level i think you you were probably not wanting to have to engage an internet blogger on these things but uh, due to the misinformation i think you felt you had to but now you're able to address some of the, the leading figures in the field because those are the people he cited in his critique of you. Is that, is that where we are in the discussion? Right. So the good thing that Dave did is he, he brought on three experts to address the chemistry uh, that I had talked about in my videos. And uh, those three experts, and then he, he, he brought on three and then he cited several others. And, and uh, so that, that's good because now I can engage particularly with those three that were, were presumably addressing my video. 
and uh, and and I could go right after their science and talk about that. Oh, and that's that's what we want to talk about. And I think you know, just uh, again an, as another preliminary, I would say that another good thing that uh, Professor Dave has done in in uh, citing these experts in uh, critique of your work is that I think it enables. Uh, his viewers and our viewers to really assess the the standing of these arguments that are being made in support of evolutionary abiogenesis. I had a supervisor in Cambridge when I was doing my PhD on origin of life biology, and he used to say that he used to say, "Beware the sound of one hand clapping." If there's an argument on one side, there's bound to be an argument on the other, and you really can't assess," he said, "the strength of an argument until you you see how well it withstands criticism," and I think that applies to the uh, to to your critique of uh, e- evolutionary abiogenesis, but also uh, Professor Dave's critique and the experts he cites critique of yours. So we have the the arguments out there, and let's so let's let's. Let's uh, revisit them and let's let our viewers hear your side of the story and, and then uh, people can begin to evaluate this for themselves as both sides of the story are, are increasingly out in public. Abiogenesis is the origin of life from non-living matter. And uh, to construct any convincing theory of abiogenesis, we must take into account the condition of the Earth about four billion years ago. These are not my definition. These are textbook dictionary definitions. Right. You, you've given a lecture, and it's a very detailed lecture with a lot of science in it. And the, the expert on the other side of the question that you, you critique and cite is a, a man named Steve Benner. So we're going to get into some of his work and her, his claims. But maybe we could start with just a basic uh, definition of, of um, life. I mean, because my supervisor used to say that behind every question about the origin of life lies Another question, which is, what is it that we're trying to explain the origin of? Or as Alexander Oparin used to put it, one of the the early chemical evolutionary theorists, the question of the origin of life and the nature of life are, are inextricably linked. We can't ex- we can't come up with a good origin of life theory unless we know what we're shooting for, what life is. So how do how do origin of life researchers and how do molecular biologists or cell biologists define life today? Well, I, I think that, that defining life, as you know, as a philosopher, is hard. Uh, defining the characteristics of life is actually a much easier thing to do. And uh, uh, we know that, that all life as we know it is made out of cells, and you have a membrane on the outside, and you have uh, DNA inside, and, and uh, you have a lot of machinery going on in there, and you have to have four classes of chemicals. You have to have the amino acids, which are the building bo- blocks of the proteins. You have to have, uh, um, poly- you have, to have s- uh, carbohydrates or sugars, which are the building blocks of the polycarbohydrates or the polysaccharides. Uh, you have to have uh, the lipids, which are, are the membrane. And then you have to have the nucleic acids, which are the DNA and the RNA. So you have to okay. have those four, four classes of chemicals. And then you have to have a functioning system that that observe that has something called homeostasis, mm-hmm. where there's there's this this internal functioning and operation of the system. It is not just throwing a bunch of molecules inside a lipid. It is it is a whole functioning together. It is a system. It is a factory in a sense. These are the characteristics of life as we know it. And what some people are trying to do is is they they have said for years that that. They'll address this and they'll make this happen, and they've not been able to get close. So now they're trying to redefine what life is. Even the same people that have defined it the very same way that I have, uh, these characteristics are trying to, to now change the argument, which is, as you know, they is effectively, a typical physical, f- philosophical approach to, yeah, to do that. Yeah. So they, they attempt to define life down to some some simpler essence or some simpler combination of molecules and say, well, that's all we really need to explain. But the fact is that life in with the characteristics that you described exists on this planet. And if we want to even get the biological, the biological evolution going, we've got, to, we've got to start with at least a functioning cell. So, and those cells have membranes, they have carbohydrates, they have proteins, they have nucleic acids, and they have intricate uh, interactions. We've got an, uh, an information uh, storage 
transmission and processing system inside the cell. So that's what exists. We have to get to that point if we're really going to provide an explanation. I think that's been a great point that you've made. 